Hello, and welcome to KQD's Teach Do Now webinar in partnership with Educator Innovator. It's Monday, August 11th, and today we'll be talking about managing your classroom to promote connected learning opportunities. I'm your host, Matt Williams, educational technologist at KQED Public Media in the Bay Area, and I'm excited to kick off this course with such amazing guests, although we're not kicking it off. This is our last one, so I should change that in my script. Um, before I introduce everyone, I'd like to take a second to explain this webinar in relation to the course and what you should expect during the week ahead. Teach Do Now is an online course open to anyone, but targeted for teachers who are interested in learning how to integrate social media and 21st century learning approaches to their teaching practice. This course is designed to present these ideas using tools like Twitter and Google Plus so that participants can experience their learning in action. Participants are encouraged to participate with questions and comments during the webinar, and you can even watch the webinar archive video later in the week and share comments then. Uh, you can also go deeper into conversation through our weekly Do Now prompts, where we provide useful resources to help steer the remainder of the weekly conversation. Just remember to use the hashtag TeachDoNow so people can see your comments. And all of the resources for discussion can be found on the Teach Do Now blog at www.kqed.org slash TeachDoNow. Um, and we also have a, a, a Teach Do Now survey which we would love participants to uh, to fill out, and we will link the uh, we'll tweet the link to that. It's surveymonkey.com/s/teachdonow, um, and uh, if you have a chance, that would be great, so we can inform our course and how and the direction of of future courses. Um, today, I'm happy to introduce our guests, who are uh, Jeremy Heiler, Kristen Turner, Aram Kabodian, Paul O, Jill Runstrom. Joel Molly and Troy Hicks. We've got quite a few all-star all-star uh, lineup today. Um, Troy will be co-moderating with the with me, um, and uh, I'd like to give everyone a chance to introduce themselves briefly. Um, so, Aram, why don't you go ahead and start? All right. Well, uh, thanks for having me. I'm my name is Aram Kabodian. I teach uh, seventh and eighth grade English at McDonald Middle School, which is in East Lansing, Michigan. And uh, I've uh, been having my class do uh, a variety of things like uh, wikis and uh, we make uh, digital stories and uh, using various other tools. I'm also a member of the National Writing Project uh, in uh, East Lansing here, a Red Cedar Writing Project. Very cool. Well, welcome and thank you so much for joining us. Uh, Jeremy, why don't you go ahead. Uh, this is your second time in the Teach Do Now webinar, but go ahead and please introduce yourself. Yeah, thanks for having me again. I appreciate it. Um, my name is Jeremy Heiler. I am a 7th and 8th grade language arts teacher like Aram. Uh, and actually, our classes have connected one year, and we did some things together online. Um, and uh, I am also a, a writing consultant for the National Writing Project, uh, the Chippewa River Writing Project, to be exact, out of Central Michigan University. And I have also co-authored um, a book with uh, Mr. Troy Hicks there, um, Create, Connect, Compose, Reading, Writing, and Learning with Digital Tools. And we do a lot of uh, work, I do a lot of work with um, mobile laptops, uh, cell phones in my classroom. We do a number of different things that revolves around social media um, and just being, on, being online learners uh, in a nutshell. Very cool. Thanks for coming again, Jeremy. Uh, Jill, why don't you introduce yourself? Hi, my name is Jill Runstrom, and uh, I teach at Cadillac High School in Cadillac, Michigan. And uh, my role there is primarily to be a media specialist, but I also teach a social media class for which there really is no formal curriculum. And so um, my quest for the last three years has been to, to write curriculum for that course. And um, in doing so, I uh, landed in uh, Jeremy and Troy's class this summer uh, through the Chippewa River Writing Project at Central Michigan University. And, um, and that's kind of led me to uh, this panel tonight, so I'm really happy to be here. Awesome. Well, thanks for joining us. Uh, our next guest is Joel Molly. Joel, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself? Hey, how are you? Um, so, yeah, I teach uh, Chittawaga Central uh, High School right outside of Buffalo, New York. And uh, I'm actually right now trying to reimagine all three of my classes. I teach this class called Digital Writing Workshop, um, which is basically a class where kids do a lot of writing and make films out of what they write. And so this past weekend I spent uh, in Washington with Matt and, and a whole host of others talking about the PBS NewsHour 
student reporting labs and how that might uh, how we might build on that curriculum and utilize their program in our classroom. So I'm kind of thinking about that class and I'm kind of thinking right now about my AP literature class which I've taken from a mostly face-to-face -face discussion based class to a class which is um, has like blended elements where students are doing a lot of work online and a lot of work face-to-face -face and that kind of workshop model. So just kind of try to work my way through all that and try to figure out how to have my kids uh, learn things and learn to write and learn to tell stories that matter um, you know within this context so that's kind of where I am right now I'm also a member of the Western New York writing project uh, right outside of Buffalo so nice awesome. to meet you all thank Talk you for doing this Joel yeah, thanks. Uh, Kristen why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself hi thanks for having me my name is Kristen Turner and I'm a teacher educator at Fordham University in New York City I am also a member of the National Writing Project most closely associated with the National Writing Project at Rutgers in New Jersey and I have a passion for researching um, and developing digital literacies and last year I started the Fordham Digital Literacies Collaborative which brings teachers together to talk about some of the issues we're going to be talking about tonight I think great Thank you for joining us. Paul, you're up. Great, thanks. Hi, everyone. I'm really glad to be here. As someone who represents uh, Educator Innovator as well as the National Writing Project, I do work for the National Writing Project. I have just really relished the collaboration with KQD and Do Now and Matt Williams and your team. That's been fantastic. Uh, the work that I do is um, focused mainly on digital literacies. I'm in a variety of arenas, and I'm excited to be talking about that and all the things that we'll be playing over tonight. Great. Thanks again for, for joining us and being awesome. Uh, Troy, you're up. I'm Troy. All right. Thanks, Matt. I'm Troy Hicks. I'm an associate professor of English at Central Michigan University, and as Jeremy alluded to earlier, uh, the director of the Chippewa River Writing Project. And I'm just really excited to be here tonight because I've collaborated with every single one of these um, great teachers and educators in one way, shape, or form, usually two or three ways, shapes and forms, and so it's going to be a great conversation. Awesome. Thank you. And so Troy will be co-moderating. He can uh, really help facilitate getting all the great uh, pieces of information from everyone. Uh, and that's not going to be easy to do within an hour because we're almost out of time now just by introducing everyone. No, I'm just kidding. Um, so to so those watching live right now, we welcome your comments via the Teach Do Now hashtag on Twitter or the Google Plus page. You can also sign into um, the chat window on this page at Educator Innovator and converse there. Um, we'll look for your questions um, and we can address them through this webinar. Um, we begin our sixth and final week of the course on the topic of managing connected learning opportunities in the classroom. Throughout the Teach Do Now course, we've explored pathways to our own professional learning, how to promote 21st century skills, media making tools and strategies, digital media's potential for increasing civic and community engagement, and how to keep our students safe online. During this webinar, we'd like to explore some of the nuts and bolts for managing this kind of practice in the classroom. So I'll be asking panelists to sort of reflect upon their experiences having done this uh, effectively um, and perhaps providing some leadership um, and some great tips and how to move forward for people who are beginning to do this kind of work. Um, so I'd first like to ask uh, panelists to talk about your classrooms and how you've set up an environment that maximizes um, some of these principles. And um, I guess we'll start, why don't we go ahead and start with Aram um, on the left here, on my left at least, to, um, and anyone you know can jump in after that if you'd like. One moment. Can you hear me? I can hear you. All right, good. Uh, well, you know, how I set it up, uh, I guess I would go back to the, um, the wiki that we started in my class uh, five or six years ago, and uh, I've been uh, trying to kind of flesh that out over the years and expand it uh, to uh, get the kids uh, sharing more of who they are uh, outside of school, sharing uh, what's interesting to them, finding ways for them to collaborate, uh, making it real for them in their, their lives and with the community. And so every year I try and add something uh, that uh, you know, is a little piece of that. One year it was the public service announcement on a, on a topic that they had already written about, but now we're uh, presenting digitally and uh, then sharing with an audience, maybe the 
principle if it was about how uh, we should be able to have cell phones in school or something like that. You know, trying to find a, an authentic audience. And so, um, you know, f I guess one of the things you've, you've touched on already, I think, is just the hurdles I think you mentioned. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, one of my recent hurdles is my uh, administration. I'm, I'm trying to do things like incorporate cell phones uh, more into uh, my uh, teaching, similar to what uh, Jeremy has done in the past. And uh, myself and the computer uh, teacher in the building are finding a lot of resistance to that uh, at the administrative level and at the board level. And I'm trying to look at different ways to uh, uh, not really get around that, but to uh, inform them and to uh, you know get the parents informed and maybe more a little bit on my side. So. Uh, those are a couple of little things I'm doing. Sure. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, I guess one of the things I'm doing this year is a mystery Skype is one of the things I'm, I'm hoping to do to huh. heighten curiosity in my students and good questions and uh, team building and, and global community. Great. So how's that going in terms of the, the cell phones and you know the fight with the, the school culture to, to allow those to be learning tools? Well, my administrator is still pretty resistant, but uh, as far as the Skype, I have a pretty uh, supportive uh, tech director, and so I'm kind of just more leaning on him than on my principal, and uh, I think we're, we're making some strides. That's great. Um, can anyone, anyone else want to talk about some of the hurdles that they have faced in doing uh, more like connected learning types of work, media production, mobile media, social media? Um, sure, Joel. you know what? Uh, Matt, I'll chime in there because I, I, I'm kind of going through some of this a similar experience uh, to around. And um, I mean, my deal is the same. Like I, I by my the official the official uh, the official regulation in the uh, at our school is there are no cell phones. So I've had to have conversations with my principal about um, being able to utilize them. And you know, a lot of times I just have to close my close my my door and kind of. Um, you know, try to keep some of what I do like uh, out of the limelight. And I mean, my principal is very—he's—he's he's accommodating, um, but it's like then you sit through faculty meetings, and a lot of times you get the message to the whole of the staff, which is absolutely no gray area, no cell phones. So it's like that you always have that kind of. Um, you know, I said that kind of unease, and and I think that that connects to like when my students are making films, right? So when they're making documentary films, a lot of times they're out in the hallway, they're shooting interviews, or doing their thing, and I mean, with the more, I mean, obviously, with the more freedom we have to help the, to have our students connect outside of our classroom, you know, the greater capacity for things to go wrong, and I think that weighs heavily on a lot of the people who have to worry about that stuff. I mean, obviously, I do as a teacher, but the administration does as well as as a board. As like, what is the perception of my school uh, when kids are tweeting out and those kids are my kids or those kids are you know at at my high school you know so what does that say about the culture of the school so they've got these larger concerns um, they kind of weigh against you know the awesome things that can happen when we have our students um, you know networked on Twitter with other professionals or other community members who have a uh, you know a shared purpose in what it is we can we are doing Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it definitely complicates things a little bit. You know, it, you know, we always have to feel it out, figure it out. I guess that's that's the big idea, right? Definitely. Um, Kristen, would you like to contribute? Any? To, well, how how did, What's the culture like where you where you're at uh, in terms so, of? It's a little different for me because I'm um, working at a university level, but I do run into some of the same issues, um, particularly from my students and the resistance, perhaps to adopting more digital technologies into the classroom and asking them to learn in ways that they've never learned before. And so I think that that is um, something that's really important for teachers of all, all levels to think about is how we can use the technologies to learn and not just to connect socially. And when you ask students to step out of their comfort zone, what does that mean for them and their um, they're stretching, I like to call it, and the pains that they go through. So for instance, this summer I taught a completely online course for pre-service pre teachers. And uh, this is not the way that um, you know early 20-somethings are used to learning because they've come through schools where digital technologies were not necessarily part of how they learned and how they connected professionally. And it's um, 
it's a lot of growing that has to happen and a lot of understanding on my part that they are growing and a lot of trust on their part that I'm going to help them grow and not just hold them accountable as a lot of teachers have done in the past. So I'd say that's the biggest challenge that I've been facing. Can you give a little bit of an example of how that kind of push and pull exists with your students in terms of the different kind of context of, of the tools that they maybe use personally? Right, so um, I, I always start the semester about a week and a half before the semester starts by sending out all of the information that my students are going to need to get set up on the technology. And I can tell right away who is gung-ho because they do it right away and they're logging into the accounts and I'm getting join requests. And then there's that... Um, you know, half the class that waits to the last minute and I, I know from the start that it's going to be a challenge for me to get them over this hurdle. And the first week of class I get a lot of emails, a lot of frustrations, um, and I just, I have to let them know I understand that this is new and this is frustrating and this is part of what I want you to learn this semester. So it's not that you're wrong or um, I I don't think that um, you're being a good student or anything. I know that this is a new way for you to learn. So it's, it's a lot of negotiation that happens virtually, which is just an interesting um, way to teach and learn, I think. Great. Um, also, some other hurdles uh, maybe people mention are just access to certain sites, uh, social media sites and so forth. Jill, would you like to talk a little bit about how to kind of overcome some of those hurdles, perhaps? Sure. Uh, for my particular class because it is entitled social media, uh, our content filter blocks the popular ones that people are familiar with, Twitter, Facebook, uh, Instagram, uh, and so I had to um, work with our IT staff, which I'm lucky to have in the same room with me, um, which is nice, and, uh, and they were able to um, open up those sites just for my class hour for my students. Um, I primarily have uh, seniors, 12th graders. Uh, occasionally I have a smattering of 11th graders in my class, but um, primarily it's 17 and 18 year old kids. So they think that's pretty neat to be entrusted with um, the responsibility uh, to to use those sites during that time um, and and have that and have that privilege during that class. It, and it makes it it makes it special for them. Um, I have to set the tone with them, though, that you know they need to understand that just because they have access to these sites doesn't mean that they can, um, you know, give out, uh, you know, violate their acceptable use policy. We talk about all those kinds of things about being responsible dig digital citizens um, in order for them to comply with the rules of being in my class. Um, but I, it also forces me to be um, proactive and I have to be forward thinking because if there's something, some new digital tool that I want to use that I haven't used before, um, I have to make sure that that is something that, that isn't uh, in the content filter that I have to have opened up. And uh, we, have a, we have a system through our curriculum process in our school whereby uh, you just, you know, you fill out a form and, and you get it uh, approved by your curriculum person and then um, you then give it to the IT department and they will open up what you need to have open. So it works really well and it uh, seems to be a good, a good way for uh, things that are in our, you know, currently being blocked um, to be open. So that was, a, that was a big hurdle that at the beginning, my first year teaching the class was like, my word, how am I going to teach this class when everything that I want the kids to have access to is blocked? So it's worked out really well. That's great. Um, I, would, I was going to ask, like, did you have to create a special relationship with the IT person to have that access during that hour? Yeah, but, but there's they, a form. They all have their offices on the perimeter of the media center, so it's kind of nice. I have I have access to them that most people don't have, so that's uh, that's a big perk for me. Great, Paul. You wanted to jump in. Yeah, I just want to say quickly, <clears throat> I'm not a classroom teacher, and so um, my perspective is is really uh, informed by the teachers I work with. And uh, in fact, just this week, I'm, I'm doing some work related to civic engagement. Um, it's a project called Educating for Democracy in the Digital Age with a number of educators in the Oakland Unified School District. Uh, that's where I live in Oakland. Um, our NWP office is based in Berkeley. And I, I just wanted to quickly say that I think one of the hurdles, um, and, and you know, this is a group of educators who are really much dedicated to this proposition of having their young people engage civically, and they understand as well through their own personal lives or what they see of their young people that 
Uh, there are these digital pathways that they want to make sure their young people have the skills to negotiate. Um, I think some, some of the issues are a lack of familiarity of what all the possibilities are that exist. Um, so I think, you know, it depends on, I think, what level of expertise you bring to the table uh, as an educator. And then I think what, we're, what we've found, and we're entering into the third year of this project, um, is that there needs to be some level of time and space, I think, to be able to, uh, to investigate, to engage in inquiry around um, what your curricular goals are, what your purposes for using digital media might be, um, as well as opportunities to play, experiment, um, and use digital media for low stakes purposes, or you know, if it's going to be for high stakes purposes, still the opportunity to play, I think. Um, and it's great to be on this webinar with everyone, and I think especially with Troy, who uh, I think years ago, like we hit upon this idea, this notion of, of opportunities to actually play with digital media, but to be able to understand for yourself as an educator uh, what the affordances and possibilities are um, as you begin to then move that work into the classroom. So I think uh, just from working with a group of teachers that have really varied experiences, um, you know, I would say time, time to understand what it is that you're engaging with and, uh, and the reasons why, basically, and as well as the time to play. Sure, and that, and I think the CL MOOC that uh, National Writing Project puts on every summer is a great way to kind of do that, is to play um, with these tools and make and sort of get a sense of how this might fit into their uh, people's teaching practice. Um, Jeremy, you wanted to talk a little bit about how you have actually have a, a little bit of a different case in your school and, and, and a nice sort of uh, culture that embraces these tools and, and uh, um, learning. Would you like to talk about that? Yeah, it's, it was just interesting to hear um, hear Arm and, and Joel talk a little bit because uh, you know my principal has been very very supportive on all of the things that um, that that we've wanted to do, or at least that at least that I've wanted to do within my classroom um, to the point to where he's gone to our superintendent and and we are going to be getting two more mobile lab carts for the upcoming school year. I mean that's that's how much he's believing in in what's going on in our classrooms with with digital um, literacies and just with with learning um, with you know online learning that's taking place um, to the point to where he gets very disappointed when he can't see those opportunities uh, about um, what we're doing as far as making connections um, I, I you know recall specifically when Arm and I and, and our classes were connecting um, something came up to where he just couldn't make it and he was very upset over the fact because he wanted to see how that was working you know, he's always got an open mind to all those things. Um, you know, and our, our biggest, uh, you know, if I talk about hurdles, our biggest hurdle is just making sure that everybody has that piece of technology in their hand outside of school and, and making sure that, you know, when it comes to them doing the things outside of school, that they have access to um, to the World Wide Web and, and to each other, connecting to each other. Um, though it is amazing with the district that I teach in being low, low to, very low income students that a lot of them do have cell phones, um, but still, you know, we're still battling that issue. It's not so much an administrative issue um, as far as um, opening up things and allowing cell phones in the classroom. So it's, a, it's just a positive, um, a positive thing for our, our school and our community and our parents are well informed uh, about those things. Um, in terms of uh, the technologies that are taking place, which is nice too. Great, uh, Troy. Yeah, I just wanted to hop in. I saw over on our chat too. Melissa Techman is adding some comments in here, um, finding it challenging that when students have little knowledge of some of the reporting issues and policies and those types of things. So I think it becomes part of a larger curricular conversation. And I sent out a link a few moments ago to an article that Kristen and I published about a year ago in English Journal called Digital Literacy Can't Wait. And um, in there we offer some suggestions for how you can work with your students and talk with your colleagues about um, this idea of creating a culture uh, of digital writing or digital literacy in your school. So I think that's a good time for us now to segue to what we hope is a another big question that everyone can um, take on and that is what's a good project to begin this work we're at the end of the teach to now series this summer um, what is it that you'd like to do to begin this work with your students how do you um, scaffold this work how do you set it up with your school administrators with parents and 
also most especially with your students, even if there's some of these reluctant ones like Kristen might have been describing. So I think uh, Joel is going to jump in first on that idea. Yeah, so uh, I, I'm afraid from a digital perspective, my answer to this question is kind of disappointing. Um, I guess the way I start the year off is just teaching my kids how to come to a face-to-face -face discussion, having you know read the resources, have, having done some research, having thoughtfully explored through writing, um, you know the topics at hand, whatever the first do now topic is it that we that we do. So what I do is, you know, we do go we go over some annotation, we go over some note taking, etc., and we go in over the expectations of a good discussion. We set the ground rules for, um, you know, what does a what does a good Harkness discussion look like? What does a good discussion look like if I'm not taking part and I'm just watching the students kind of mull over the ideas that are in bringing up evidence and referring to the text? So it's very uh, for me, the first step is always, all right, let's lay that very solid foundation so that I know that the conversations we have are going to be, you know, deep and thoughtful and, um, you know, worthy of the great resources that KQED puts forth. I think that, um, that, that, that uh, yeah, so that, that, that's basically my first step. Very cool. Anyone else want to chime in about uh, just some of the projects that you've done that kind of embrace these these uh, connected learning principles? Uh, well, I think Jill might have something to add here. The first year I do the first year that I taught my course, I thought about projects and giving kids some autonomy, but also giving them some direction. And so I came up with the idea um, for Cadillac High School, so CHS, and uh, and so I used the at sign and I, and I and I wrote at CHS on the board and and we brainstormed for about a week um, what kinds of things could we do using social media using digital tools that uh, that you that the students could do um, in groups of two to four that uh, would benefit the school somehow um, we brought in the the principal the assistant principal we you know we quizzed people and um, and they, the kids came up with some interesting projects, um, one of which was we have a small uh, courtyard in our school that's uh, kind of overgrown with weeds and just get, isn't really, uh, doesn't have anything done with it. And so uh, a group of kids um, connected with some, you know, the local garden club and some other um, places, uh, the Michigan State University um, extension that does, they analyze the soil and they did different things, um, so that was an interesting project. Uh, another group of kids um, contacted uh, Steve Dembo with uh, Discovery Education and, and he helped them with um, some ideas on how um, students like to learn and they did a, a survey monkey and, and uh, surveyed the students, put up little tents on the, on the uh, lunch tables at school and collected data and then presented to the staff on how students like to learn digitally, uh, their, their findings. Um, another group of kids, the principal came in and said, you know, I really hate giving the opening day, uh, the opening day assembly and talk about all the rules. I think it's really boring. Could you guys do some sort of a spoof uh, video that, you know, displays what the rules are in terms of dress code and, and uh, backpacks and different things. And so the, the kids made a video uh, which was really cute. So um, that that had some success. That was a kind of a neat idea. They got to choose, and it was their their projects were very quite varied, and but yet along the uh, theme. Great. I am um, fairly multitasking. Can I just add a footnote on that? Yes. I was trying to write the tweet for Jill's comment there, and I see that <laughs> service learning and connected learning in teaching social media, and I think that's just awesome. So I just wanted to footnote that really quick. Thanks. Very cool. Um, so any other examples of projects like uh, Aram, would you like to talk about what you've done with your students? Well, this past year uh, I did connect with the science classes and uh, we, we chose the topic of uh, global warming and uh, what we can actually do about it. Um, and I think the the topic, or the actual question was, um, well, but what what do you think we should do about global warming? Because uh, for some kids who get a lot of pressure from their parents, 
um, the answer is nothing. You know, we, we should do nothing about it because it doesn't really, there is no problem, right? So um, we, we have to kind of keep those kids in mind. But anyway, we, we offered uh, a wide variety of ways for them to respond to that. They could be writing an essay. They could be making a digital story, uh, kind of a public service announcement. They could be doing a, uh, other forms of other projects. Um, but giving them choice uh, about a topic that was interesting to them um, was um, I think key and that was the first year that we have done that uh, particular project and I think uh, next time we may um, change some things but I, I hope that uh, the science teachers will be open to uh, uh, tweaking it a little bit and uh, trying it again. Um, I get that a little bit of what you're talking about I think. Very cool. Do you have a link that you could share Arm? I was looking on your wiki and I couldn't quite find anything. Yeah, about. Yeah, I'll pull it up, sure. Awesome. Thanks. I think Jeremy has a, a suggestion for a project that he'd like to talk about, too. Yeah, we do. Um, it's called the Salmon in the Classroom Project, and it started with just our science teacher, and it's actually scaffolded, and it's become this big, uh, you know, and I say giant entity in all the positive uh, notions in the world um, with it becoming this big entity but um, you know it's the idea of the students raising the SAM and the te um, us being the teachers we have to get a special license from our Department of Natural Resources and and then we have to uh, we, the students basically raise salmon in the classroom uh, for uh, from November through through May and and then um, what we've done is we scaffold it over the years to where it was just the science teachers uh, doing this um, and then uh, it went to the math teachers. Uh, it was a, a cross-curricular project between science and math. Uh, and then um, last year I got involved with it where they started doing some argumentative writing, um, uh, informational and argumentative writing, uh, as Troy said in the chat, um, where they had to argue for is this something that's valuable for, for our economy and, and for the natural resources. And um, so there's a lot of connected learning there because of the fact that the students are made, uh, they, when they go and they release these salmon, they're interacting with people um, with the Department of um, uh, Environmental uh, Water Quality, and so they're interacting with these people that actually these real they're making these real uh, connections with people, and they're these reports that they're putting together are are going to authentic audiences, um, and they're using Google Docs to collaborate um, at, with students with teachers. Um, this past year, when the social studies teacher jumped on board. Um, then they started talking more about economy, geographical locations. Um, so it beca it's become this big, huge entity, and it's it's taken off so much that this past uh, spring we were featured. Our school was featured on, on the Michigan Outdoors uh, uh, show um, for you know what the kids are doing to give back to the community um, and give back to uh, give back to our great state of Michigan. So um, it's really grown into this really big. Piece and uh, these infographics. These students are creating these infographics at the end of this project too, with their writing that um, displays the type of pr uh, predator and prey that are taking that are going on in this creek where they release uh, the salmon. Um, so there's a lot of you know digital tools that are being used and the way they're writing their their papers, um, the way they're analyzing graphs and interpreting graphs and, and how they apply apply what they're learning to the graphs to the the current situations that are going on. So there, there's just a lot of stuff that's going on in this project. It's such a huge huge thing. Uh, but it's really awesome for the kids because they really embrace it because it has so, such a real life, um, um, I guess, uh, aura about it. Um, and the kids know that it, it's not something that's just made up by the teachers. <laughs> that's great. When they when they make those uh, when they produce it, do they? Is it just uh, how is it shared? Is there a sharing sort of component to it? Or? Yeah, it's shared. It's shared with our administration, and it's shared with board members. And also, um, we started sharing it with uh, some of the Department of um, Environmental Quality people. We started sharing it with them, um, and uh, some of the stuff has been shared through blogs. Uh, is going to start being shared through blog posts and stuff next year. Um, the students are going to start doing some blog posts uh, as they um, analyze fish, the fish tank, uh, and, um, and when they're doing the water testing and, and how they're you know, this they're going to go through this whole project uh, throughout a year and some blog posts next year. Uh, the other little bit uh, that I forgot to add too is um, we put a webcam up for people to access our website, so the uh, so outside people could come in and see the fish and see them grow. It was a it was a fish it was a well, underwater cam or whatever that they had for uh, people to look at. Well, that's really exciting. Yeah. Um, Joel, you wanted to chime in. 
Yeah, that'd be great. So the, the project that I'm thinking of, which isn't necessarily a beginning of the year project, but it is kind of like a beginning connected learning type project, is this thing that I did last year with my digital writing workshop class, which is a um, which had to do with we, we kind of built from from the idea of this TED talk, right? So um, what I did was I connected my students with this you know large repository. We all know this TED talks, and I basically told them that for the next four days, I just want them to watch TED talks. I want them to choose, and they could watch the entirety of, of, of one talk. They could watch two minutes of a talk. They could check in, check out, do whatever, do whatever they wanted. But while they were watching these TED Talks, I wanted them to take notes, um, further questions that were being uh, inspired, uh, what they learned, etc. track the links, blah, 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 doing a little Google Doc. Um, so from there, after they consume these TED Talks, I asked them to, okay, um, now that you've watched all these, what's like a topic you might be interested in? What might, where might be one area you want to go and further explore? And so that's when the research kicked in. You know, so they did this preliminary surveying, and then they really dug deep and went into this larger topic. And I can see the same thing happening with Do Now. You know, just read a series of Do Nows over the next, over the first couple of months, and then go back and find a topic you're really interested in. Um, but then the the production people well, actually, while they are watching the initial TED talks. And while they were doing uh, most of the early steps of the process, they were asked to tweet out uh, important quotes, uh, talks that really moved them. And we did this little hashtag. It was, uh, I think, it was something to do with my class. I can't remember it right now. But um, so they were sharing this information amongst their own peers, maybe tweeting at some of the people who were giving the talks originally, uh, that kind of stuff. So it was really cool. Um, ultimately. Uh, students were asked to, to make something out of their, their research. So they wrote a kind of formal research paper and then they made something. Some kids made a documentary, some kids did uh, infographics, um, some kids did uh, a whole host of things like a Wordle in conjunction with a photo story or whatever. Uh, so they had all these opportunities to make something to share their research um, and present it to the class. That's really exciting. I just wanted to say something really quickly just about this semester's Do Now, and that is we will be uh, scheduling uh, a Do Now once a month that is predetermined so that there's going to be time for teachers to kind of look at it, consider projects, uh, and, and time for classroom uh, uh, production to, to make more meaningful engagement pieces to the Do Now discussion. So, so that instead of just it being a week where it's pretty difficult to do, you have a month to kind of consider it. So that might also lend itself towards more media making in response to uh, current events. Um, but anyway, go ahead, Troy. Sorry about that. Or I think it was Kristen, sorry, who wanted to who wanted to say. No, I was just I love all these ideas that we are throwing out, and I also want to acknowledge that a lot of them are, are super complicated and and might seem overwhelming, and it's just really important to grab hold of something and jump in and try it. And um, I remember when Troy first introduced me to the idea of a wiki uh, many moons ago at this point, I said, wow, this is great. There's so much I can do with this, and I'm not quite sure how it's going to work in my classroom yet, but I'm going to try it. And that wiki from, what, maybe 2009 looks very different from the wiki that I just treated out in, in 2014. And over that time, I've reflected on my practice, and I've figured out how to make my students more of the contributors and me less of me more a facilitator um, but that's a, a trial and error and a continually learning process and one of the things I love about the digital literacies, literacies collaborative at Fordham is that teachers come together to talk about these things to try them but then also to admit that their students are experts that can help them too so um, one of the teachers in the collaborative decided to create an after school digi club where um, her students were basically teaching her how to teach her students some of these technical aspects that she wasn't that familiar with. And that DigiClub has evolved, so now the students are actually creating help um, tools for other students and for teachers in the school. And it's a very small group of students now, but I know it's going to grow. And, and just this idea of connecting as learner as a teacher is, is really important, too. Great. You know, I just wanted, yeah, I just want to jump in and say, first of all, I, I uh, second uh, all the things that Kristen just said. Um, I think it's really critical to to not think that you know, at the start you have to have this enormous project. Um, on the other hand, these projects are really awesome. So uh, kudos to all of you. 
Uh, the thing that I want to say quickly is less about having a specific project and more about uh, the notion, it seems to me, that I think is at the heart of you now, which is, um, you know, what are your what are your young people interested in? What are they passionate about? And how might you, uh, so one, one way to think about the start is, how might you understand what it is actually that they are interested in, um, which is a fundamental aspect of connected learning, and then, and then figure out the ways in which they might pursue that interest, be it through you now, be it through any one of these uh, particular projects. So it seems to me like uh, that, that's one starting point. Very cool. Um, so yeah, go ahead, Troy. Oh, I was going to say, it looks like there's a question from the chat room for Joel to uh, tackle really quickly, and then we'll shift to our third big question. Okay. I, uh, it's been a couple of months. Uh, the question that, that was posed from the chat room is for me to speak a little bit more about the final make for the TED Talk project. And what I'm, <laughs> what I'm trying to scurry and do is go into my Google Drive so I can uh, remind myself about what some of those big questions were. But just to kind of throw one example at you, and this was, you know, I, I, I appreciate uh, the one comment um, about uh, these projects seeming very overwhelming and complicated, and they are. I mean, as all projects that are cool um, are, you kind of like design them as you go, and they become Franken projects, etc. So, anyways, one of my students, this girl Yaleshka, uh, she, her, her big question, her big inquiry question uh, was, is film school the right choice for me? So she watched some TED talks. I think she watched the one about, um, I think the guy who. Uh, I forget that one of the Pixar guys has this great TED talk, and she started her thinking. You know, should I go to film school or should I do it the indie way? What's best for me? So she did some research. And it just so happened. I mean, this was a big question on her mind that she went down she to Orlando to this big YouTube conference and used that as a part of her research. And you know, so this is like the one percent that's like never happens. But she went down there with her camera, interviewed a bunch of people, uh, interviewed some of her people she watches on YouTube, um, these kind of vloggers. To get Gather more research, found some experts, etc., and then spun like a you know like a five or six minute documentary out of it, and it was really awesome. In a couple seconds, I'll share the link once I find that. But um, kind of like a less uh, a project that was less complicated, but also equally cool. So some students had these questions like, um, you know, I think. Uh, if I can remember exactly, it was like, what is love, or why does love fall apart? Uh, why do relationships break up? That kind of thing. So these girls did this, you know, really nice research, and then one girl said, you know what? I am going to write a series of poems. I'm going to match them up with images. I'm going to do a kind of like photo story, and I think that's the best way for me to present this story. Uh, what I found out through all this research, like the different stages of breakup, how to cope, etc. So the projects kind of really vary depending on what it was that kid was looking into, but there were some, definitely some cool samples. Like I said, I'll share out that link in a second, and if, uh, if I think of anything more, I'll type it in the little box for the chat. Great. Thanks. Jeremy, you want to chime in? Well, yeah, it was just going on to Troy, was, uh, as far as assessment practices to use in your classroom, um, you know, as far as my, how my thinking has changed, you know, since doing this is that assessment is not the same for every every student, and, and it can't and it can't be that way. Um, you know, for instance, you know, when my students are doing their multi genre research project and and they have to come up with some artifacts, not every student is you know choosing to turn in a a five page research paper or even a, a two page research paper. They may uh, produce a a digital vi uh, you know video of what they've learned, or they may. Um, you know, they may create a um, an online um, uh, uh, scavenger hunt or, or something along those lines. It's not. It, it's 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 such a different environment when it comes to online learning and being connected. Because, and, and I think that's where we fail when it, in terms of of assessments, because we want our students to. Uh, as far as standardized assessments, let me be more clear there, um, is that we want our students to do the same thing, every student to do the same thing, and that's not that's not how every student learns. Every student learns differently, and and that's the big mind shift that's changed in, in, with me is is opening that door to other students. You know, if, if a student is uh, reluctant to to do a paper, and then it's okay. So if you don't want to do this paper, then let, here's some guidelines that I want you to follow. Now within those guidelines, what can you uh, produce for me that shows me that you've learned this particular, or you've mastered this concept? So um, 
you know, that's the big mind shift that's that's taken effect for me, uh, and I, I just think it. I think it's a shift that we, as teachers, we all have to take on because um, if we want this shift, and I'm not trying to, you know, make this about standardized testing, but if we want to make that shift away from standardized testing, that um, we all have to be united on that front to to let people know that not every student is it needs to be assessed the same way. That's true, Jeremy. One thing that I was going to add. Uh, that I always include uh, or have included recently more and more is a reflection, uh, getting the kids to uh, think critically about uh, what their process of learning was and how the, uh, the final result matched with what they were hoping for and uh, you know, what they liked and didn't like about the process and how much I helped them and how much I could help them more in the future so that I can improve a little bit also. Uh, you know, so giving them some, some previous times to reflect during the year so that then when they get to this reflection it makes some sense you know modeling some reflection seventh graders don't reflect very much okay in their lives uh, I find anyway and um, so you know I have to really kind of scaffold it but uh, I do include it as part of uh, all these projects that I've been trying to do uh, lately and um, I think it's it's rewarding uh, for their future uh, learning opportunities. So they'll be reflective learners in the future uh, to get them in that habit uh, to be thinking about what they're, not, what they're doing, not just going through the emotions of doing it. So that's one aspect of um, assessment is that self-assessment uh, that uh, I've included. Very cool. Anyone else want to chime in about uh, assessment or reflection in the process of, of uh making media or doing projects in the classroom. I'd like to jump in just for a moment and maybe put a slightly different lens on this because sure. I think as, as we think about the whole KQED series that you've done and the Connected Learning MOOC and 21st Century Learning and, and we've, we've been hearing obviously for a long, long time that we're no longer the sage on the stage, we're the guide on the side. But I think what's really particularly incredible about this group of people is that they are doing it, and I, I appreciate what Jeremy and Aram have already added. I'm really hoping that all of you get a chance to talk, like really nitty gritty, like specifics. Like, what are some of the things that you've had to change about your approach to teaching, or like literally your actual instruction, um, your curriculum, the way you talk about your teaching with your colleagues? Like, what are some of the the golden nuggets, I guess, that come out of all of this is, as you've made this shift, because it is a very big shift that has to happen, and um, I think Jeremy and um, Aram have already alluded to a few of those things, giving kids multiple options for projects, um, asking them to reflect, because yes, seventh graders are not naturally <laughs> reflective, but what other very specific advice might you all have, as, especially as you're thinking about these new opportunities for digital reading and writing. Go for it. Go ahead, Jill. You're on mute. Sorry, I had to unmute. Uh, the one thing that I have learned, especially with 17 and 18 year old kids, uh, they are in a frame of mind in their life where they really feel like they know everything. And I always assumed uh, working with them in the in the library uh, on computers that they really were very tech savvy and did know a whole bunch but what I learned after teaching them in my social media class is that they really aren't as savvy in the, the nitty-gritty of learning digital tools as I thought they were they can manage the social media aspect of the social part but learning how to teach themselves how to struggle through something and to figure out ways to uh, come up with answers to questions without having someone spoon feed it to them was something that I was uh, shocked by. I just thought that that was just native to them and it's not always. So I think we sometimes as adults make that assumption that they're digital natives and that they'll just pick it up and a lot of them do but we need to set the groundwork for them on, on things. And, and I found, too, that especially working with kids that are juniors and seniors, um, they get to the point where they're, you know, I give them the autonomy, I give them the chance to, 
to pick things and, they're, and they want to know, well, how are you going to grade this? Where's the rubric? And they don't like it. So there's some, there's some discomfort there that you have to overcome from the student's end because they're so used to traditional learning that when you try these new approaches, um, it's, it's difficult for them too. It's, they, it's uncomfortable for them and they don't like it. So I found that a really interesting dynamic that I wasn't expecting when I started to teach my class. Sorry, I was on mute. Um, Aram, did you want to chime in about uh, what Jill had to say? Well, yeah, I guess I would just uh, ditto what uh, what uh, Jill just said. I I go in sometimes uh, thinking that they will get it a lot faster or that they already know these things, and then I find that there are a few that, who master it quickly and who can help the others, and you know I have that core, but the the majority. Uh, don't use their computer in this way. They use you know, all the other stuff, social media, games. They, they, they aren't um, researching and they aren't, you know, word process, whatever it is. They, would, they just don't look at their computer that way. So I had to get them to look at their computer a little differently and to get some of their peers who do know what's going on to uh, support me and them uh, in a nuts and bolts fashion. And then it, it can turn... Uh, during the year, but uh, initially there are a lot of kids who uh, really are resistant and uh, sort of clueless about the whole thing. So how do you guys manage that, that classroom environment where you have some students who are really, you know, savvy with learning tools or no tools, and then you have others who are, you know, a little bit, uh, are not quite as, as versed, like how do you kind of set that up? Um, if, uh, Joel. Well, I was just going to say that one thing that's cool about the production-based classroom is that it, it, it naturally lends itself to differentiation and, you know, small group and, and, and individual attention because when you have kids working, um, making, then some kids are so immersed in that making act, they really don't, <laughs> they have no use for you. So it frees you up to kind of work one-on-one -on -one or in small groups with those kids who really do uh, have a use for you. And the same, I mean, the same goes for writing, um, although kids tend to get a little bit more distracted sometimes while writing than they do when they're, you know, in the midst of editing video or something like that. So. Jeremy, did you want to chime in? Well, I was just telling Troy that, you know, because he was asking about, you know, the idea of, you know, how is the traditional, the traditional things kind of gone to the wayside in the classroom. Well, it's, you know, I do a thing with my students that they're digital lit literature circles um, where the students are, you know, a group of students are reading the same book and they use a tool, an online tool called Sully, and actually we, and, and Jill can, can uh, um, talk about, you know, her experience with that because we used it for our, our institute this summer. Um, but uh, my students use that to have conversations outside of class about the book, and it's interesting to to see things pop up at nine thirty, ten o'clock at night when a student has a question about the reading, or you know, all of a sudden it was just it's one of those odd times where you know they were thinking about the book, and so they they put something in this in this cell that they're a part of this online cell that goes out to their group member cell phones and, and to my own, so I can see what they're they're talking about and what they're discussing. So um, you know the the idea of the walls have been bro just been broken down. The learning doesn't just take place within the classroom anymore. It takes place outside of the classroom as well, and um, and then that allows you to 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 get into those deeper thinking moments with your students um, when they come back into the classroom instead of having those what I deem as boring conversations about literature with your students. With the, we have the same students that are answering the same questions all the time, so it's it's a lot different. Um, and and Sally has helped with that. That's one of the tools that I use. It's really helped with that. Great. Jill, do you want to chime in? Well, one of the tools that um, I found for my project work for Troy's class that I took this summer was uh, this, the RISE model, and it's, uh, it's www.risemodel.com, and it's a really easy uh, way for um, teachers to evaluate students and for students to evaluate their own progress. There's two different um, pyramids and they, they, they kind of dovetail with uh, Bloom's taxonomy and I have not actually used them in my classroom but I plan on using them because assessment for me has always been the most difficult part uh, of, of this whole 
idea of digital learning and digital writing. Um, so I'm looking forward to incorporating that into my practice this year. Great. That sounds interesting. Um, Paul, did you want to uh, say something about it as well? We're, we're almost yeah. uh, at the hour as well, but go ahead. Yeah, I'll just um, quickly say that I think in this question of assessment that Victoria brought up uh, that a lot of people were talking about you know, so smartly, um, I, I think that there is just this huge challenge in terms of, uh, you know, with, with the kinds of digital products that our young people are developing, to, to even determine what, what is it that we're assessing, you know, what, what is it that we're looking for in these kinds of products. Uh, I think it's, you know, in some sense it's a very new world. Um, let alone how we assess uh, that work. So I think, you know, there's still very much an open question. Um, and then the last thing that I would say, you know, in relation to assessment, um, and I would say actually there's a group called the Open Portfolio Project that is beginning to think that through. Um, the last thing I was going to say is that, or an additional thing, is um, I think one question that hasn't really come up in this conversation and that I think often does not get um, spoken about enough is, our, our questions of equity, um, and I don't even just mean like who has access to technology or not, but I think um, issues of equity in terms of what we're preparing our young people to be able to do, um, and who essentially has uh, the you know the tools of production at their disposal, um, and I, you know I think that that's just a huge question in terms of um, I, I suppose when Troy was asking, or perhaps he asked us in the chat, you know like what is the nugget that you take away? Um, from this work, and one nugget for me is just simply this question of, um, you know, the the systemic um, uh, consequences of not giving our young people these kinds of opportunities. You know, what does it mean for them as they enter into society and into a world in which uh, to not have these kinds of uh, opportunities um, to exercise you know, the ability to create and compose um, really is to their detriment. That's a great, that's a great point, Paul. Um, we're almost out of time, but uh, I wanted, uh, I think Kristen had something, sort of some final thoughts before we wrap up. So I, I think Paul is kind of leading into them nicely, and I, I love everything that I'm hearing tonight because, as Troy mentioned before, it's, it's a shift in mindset as a teacher, and it's an important shift for us to make because we know that reading and writing has changed, so the literacy has changed, and um, we are needing to help our students. Uh, I think that Jeremy and Troy's book, Create, Compose, and Connect with each other, and Troy and I have done some research this last year looking at how teenagers read and we found that that the reading is really a connected reading type of thing so so students are sharing a lot of reading material with each other they're also finding a lot of material and it's it's part of a, a networked practice and so we as teachers need to think about what it means to evaluate text and to engage with text in a savvy way so that students can learn and and really be critical about what they're doing online so um, kudos to all the teachers that are here and that you're really getting this work off the ground that's great. Well, thank you, Kristen. And these are all amazing resources and, and tips, and, and this conversation has been extremely rich. I feel like we could go on for another hour at least. Um, unfortunately, we can't, and it's, it's, we're at the hour. Um, and this, is, this marks the, the, the last, uh, sixth and last uh, Do Now, Teach Do Now webinar. Um, and I want to thank uh, our panelists for, for coming uh, and taking some time from their uh, busy schedules to, to talk and share such great ideas and thoughts. Um, this has been amazing. Um, please feel free to go back to the kqd.org Teach Do Now to view materials that can help shape your teaching practice um, and, and continue to have the conversation this week about uh, managing connected learning principles in the classroom. Um, we're almost out of time, so I want to just, again, take the last minute to thank our guests and to thank all of you for watching and participating in the chat. Um, Another note I wanted to make is that we have a survey for Teach Do Now, so please, uh, we've tweeted that link. It's it's a uh, survey monkey slash s slash Teach Do Now. So if you've been participating in this course, please, it would be great to sort of hear how you think it's gone thus far for you. Um, and then lastly, um, we have a Do Now working group that starts up this fall, and we're looking for a pr uh, applications from teachers. So I hope that people uh, who are listening and even people who are on this panel to consider uh, joining our Do Now working group for the fall. Um, and you can learn more about that at kqed.org slash do now, where you can scroll down and then there's a little uh, blog post that says applications for uh, Do Now is up. 
Um, so this marks the last webinar. And uh, again, thank you so much for, for joining us. And uh, have a great rest of the week. And uh, goodbye, y'all. Thanks so much.